good morning, good day, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm thrilled to see you, even if it's on the screen. Um, and I'm waving the um, director of the Urban Planning PhD program. And uh, since you are on time, we'll start on time. And it is being recorded, so I hope that's okay with all of you. And if you don't want to be, uh, you know, on the recording, you can turn off your video. Uh, what I thought I would do today, since you know I really only have an hour, also because of the you know, the time zone differences, is getting to be midnight in many parts of the world uh, from where you some of you are dialing in. So I want to focus more on your questions. Uh, I thought I would just uh, share a very brief introduction of our program, and then another faculty colleague of mine will also likely be joining me to answer your uh, questions. So while you're listening or you already have some questions, so feel free to type in the chat box. Emily, our program manager, uh, will be collecting those and then addressing them uh, uh, to me uh, quickly. So yeah, I see Hiba. Hiba, you wanna introduce yourself really quickly? Hi, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Hiba. I'm a professor in the urban planning program. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, excited to see so many people from around the world. Uh, Weiping and I are, are happy to answer any questions you have uh, about our program. Uh, it's morning for us, but from wherever you're dialing in. Uh, so yeah. Thank you, Hiba. Um, and then uh, Emily, you want to also introduce quickly so that you know, in case you get questions, folks uh, know who you are. Okay, Emily will be there in a minute, I think. All right, excellent. So let me then start with this very brief presentation. Uh, really, I wanna focus, um, oh, hold on a second, uh, yeah. Focus quite a bit more on the unique um, opportunities in our program and uh, uh, how we, uh, work with doctoral students. So, you know, if you have philosophical questions about what doctoral programs should do or what people can do after doctoral program, that this is probably not a place for that. Um, you can, you know, have a conversation with your mentors, your, also your professors on those questions. Um, so, of course, you all have made up your mind or at least are thinking about coming to a PhD program. So why Columbia Urban Planning PhD, right? So that's really the key question. And uh, first, I really wanna say that uh, similar to our master's program, uh, our curriculum is dynamic and flexible. So we do require students to take courses in the first two years, but uh, we don't have a large number of required courses so that our students can take advantages of the entire campus and uh, really connecting knowledge across disciplines. And we find that tremendously uh, important for our students. And we often tell our students, you have five years of unfeathered, you know, or opportune time to explore about your intellectual growth, to decide what kind of scholars you wanna become or what kind of policy practitioners or researchers you wanna become. And it's really important to go beyond the regular bounds and to really explore deeply about your uh, intellectual interests. So that's one thing that I think makes us very unique and very, very um, uh, sort of to us a great opportunity. Um, second, uh, we do very much center center uh, social, racial, and climate justice in built environment. So the relationship to the built environment is important. We have a relatively uh, moderate uh, size of full-time faculty. So we're not able to cover every single aspect of planning or urban inquiries. And so we really uh, focus on a number of uh, aspects, which I will just spend a minute to elaborate a little bit. And then we have a very strong competitive perspectives uh, through faculty and courses. 
um, bridging global north and global south. We do have faculty with regional expertise and that is a big plus. Uh, Overall, however, we really emphasize, you know, understanding global south and theories based off of global south and uh, in a way connecting to the issues that are uh, presenting to, you know, across different countries, you know. Um, and we also have uh, really in the recent years um, built a critical strength in urban science and analytics not in a way of pure uh, technological or um, quantitative or quote unquote scientific expertise, but really from a very critical uh, vantage point to examine, uh, using those tools to examine uh, important um, planning and urban issues. So notice that I do um, uh, focus uh, and in my, you know, kind of uh, presentation, not just planning, but also urban. Uh, in our master's degree, we very much focus on planning, um, but we have a lot of courses on urban issues and we do so even more in the PhD program. And we are very much uh, preparing our students for uh, not just being uh, ready for academia, but also other kinds of research and professional careers. And so, and you can quickly see that our program has been along in history since 1953 for the PhD program and 1935 for the uh, a master's program. Um, and uh, this dynamic and a flexible curriculum, uh, you can see here that the required first two years, uh, the courses, are essentially uh, six courses and uh, three of which are colloquium and then two, one in uh, advanced planning theory, another planning history. So I won't read them, you can see. And this recording will be posted on the website if you wanna see details of this presentation, you can certainly uh, uh, you know, spend a little more time after today. Uh, we, sh we should be able to post it towards end of next week probably. And then we would like our students to be uh, really uh, home their research uh, methods or methodological approaches. And so you're gonna take other courses um, and then courses to, the, to an area of specialty that you hope to focus on. And that area of specialty also becomes the exam area for your comprehensive exam. And then for those of you who are coming from a non-planning background, or even if uh, a, you know coming from a planning pro uh, program, but uh, in a very different context, we highly encourage students to take our history and theory of planning course in the master's core, because we approach that in a very global post-colonial uh, uh, way and very unique among many planning programs. And then our geographical information systems required course for master's students is also very unique, not just you know, clicking through screens and trying to uh, know how to use GIS to produce maps, but really is a critical examination of how we use spatial tools to understand urban and planning issues. And so opportunities across Columbia as uh, can see, so th this is just, a, you know, of course includes all of the schools at Columbia, but uh, uh, the various programs I include here uh, represent programs from which our doctoral students have taken classes in. And uh, you can see the range of op opportunities. And uh, if not all, but most of these programs have doctoral students of their own. So it's also building peer groups, um, building communities of scholars by taking these courses. And so to say, you know, about the, the importance, the critical uh, positioning of racial, social and climate justice in our curriculum, I just, this is the list of courses that we have for our master's students and all PhD students are welcome to take these. Some uh, PhD students take here and there one or two, but some take quite a few. And these are completely open. Some are more introductory for um, master's students, but others are quite uh, critical and in-depth or technical, technically uh, comprehensive. So that's in the built environment, 
direction and then community and economic development direction, we also have a set of courses. All of these courses are offered at least once every two years. Most of courses are offered every year. So you can plan when you get in. And then this comparative perspective bridging global north and global south is also growing that in terms of our course offerings. And this is just in the planning program. This does not include uh, courses in SIPA, School of International Public Affairs, which is very strong on uh, international front. Uh, but also uh, we have political science and sociology, for instance, in arts and sciences that our students get to take and then the Committee on Global Thought. And then the critical strength in urban science and uh, uh, analytics, it's also growing and there's a new degree happening at GSAP on more computational design practices that will start next year. And so we're hoping that this is going to become a quite a critical cluster within GSAP. And then of course, there is the Data Science Institute uh, uh, at Columbia. So the readiness for academic research and professional careers um, comes through in a number of ways. Of course, the beauty of coming to a, a doctoral program is the um, close one-on-one -on -one relationship that each student builds with their faculty, right? Not only their advisor, but also other faculty in the program or even sometimes beyond the program. In addition to those, we have uh, a number of uh, um, ways of supporting and, uh, and resources for students. And so you can take a look really quick. The one that I we are very proud of is the financial support we offer to our students. So as as long as you are admitted, a student is admitted, and then that student is entitled to at least five years full scholarship, which includes tuition and a stipend, as well as annual uh, summer stipend, which is on top of the regular stipend. And then so each student in their second to fourth year uh, will perform either as a teaching fellow, uh, usually um, they are teaching fellows to support core courses for the master's program, like planning history, planning methods, and um, economics, and planning law, and studios. And, and occasionally there will also be opportunity for a student to become a research fellow to work with an individual faculty. Um, and then, so that means the first and fifth year, there is no responsibility required of the doctoral student uh, to perform any of these um, uh, support role for the master's program. And uh, we felt like the second to fourth year um, fellowship uh, it's important for students also to build up a teaching portfolio if they're going into academia uh, or a research portfolio uh, in terms of publication collaboration. And then these other kinds of opportunities are out there. And so our doctoral students, for instance, are really instrumental in putting together and connecting with scholars across the world uh, in being the sort of the main um, uh, organizers of our uh, weekly lecture series. And so um, that's in uh, the second year of doctoral studies. So coming out to the, uh, the nitty gritty in terms of your application and the review uh, of your application, um, just uh, keep in mind that we have um, pushed forward the application deadline to December 16th of this year. And it's really important that your application uh, is on time uh, because we will start reviewing shortly after you know, the holidays. And um, uh, all details about the application and the process you can find through the link from GSAP, but actually goes to the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, because um, uh, even though uh, this is a GSAP program, 
the administration in terms of awarding the diploma and degree uh, is through uh, graduate school of arts and sciences. And um, just want to uh, share with you a little bit of thoughts on the application, right? Uh, some institutions require a doctoral applicant to have a proposal for the research that they intend to do well in the doctoral program. We um, approach this in somewhat different way. We really feel that uh, you know the intellectual exploration and understanding your of your own strength and uh, development potentials is really important once you come in to the program. So we really don't ask for that. We ask for, so sort of, you know, to see some evidence from you on that, the way of thinking that, that you use to approach uh, different challenges or issues on the ground or theoretically, conceptually, however you want to couch it. And then you show us that you can um, carry out independent research um, and the evidence can be multiple different uh, types. And then your writing ability is really, really important. And so a writing sample or two is very useful. I would discourage a very long writing sample. So we would not have the time to really read like an entire thesis but maybe a chapter would be good. Any publications you've had, a term paper you've done uh, would all be an excellent um, you know, type of writing sample. And so the personal statement for us is an important space for us to look. It's that we want to see your academic preparation, but not just that. We're not interested in like which high school, which college. I mean, that's, that's all gonna be on your transcript but how you prepare yourself for the doctoral program is what we're looking for in terms of academic preparation. That is, um, you are interested in one or two areas of urban studies or planning. Tell us why are you interested? Tell us how you see uh, uh, about that topical areas. Tell us your understanding of the major theories and arguments and debates around those topics. And where do you stand? It's okay you stand across from some major theorists, but we wanna see how you reasoned and how you approach a, a important issue in the field or even neighboring fields. Say if you come from landscape, that's fine, right? Landscape architecture, but um, your interest must be uh, somewhat related to urban and planning and tell us how you see that linkage and connection. And we also would like to see um, in your personal statement, uh, your experience with analytical reasoning uh, could be quantitative, could be spatial, could be qualitative, okay? And last, in terms of the review process that uh, um, we review as a faculty collectively. So we do not match uh, advisors at, at the review uh, um, stage, certainly maybe not even in the first year of a doctoral program. We would like the students to explore as long as we have capacity to direct a student in terms of topical interest, we are fine with uh, you know, admitting a student. So then uh, we'll, have, we'll host a, a, a group discussion with an, um, a much smaller number of uh, finalists and this will probably happen um, in early February or so, uh, so the, we'll be in touch uh, to, with those of students who uh, we would like to invite for that. And then um, we hope to um, um, send out admission or waitlist decisions um, in March, but some decisions uh, may come a little bit later, but certainly the more positive decisions will come earlier. So last um, would be, I would encourage you to explore and discover um, by going to our website. We have past dissertations of our students. All, you know, you can see their full dissertations. You can see our alumni placement all on our website. And um, if you have questions, given that um, um, we, we do have a lot of interest both in the 
PhD program as well as in the master's program. Uh, we cannot guarantee that we can answer to your inquiry um, fully each time. And so um, uh, be prudent in reaching out, uh, do your homework and really kind of discover what we already have posted on the website. So with that, uh, let me stop this part and uh, we already have questions. So Hibbert and I will then start answering these questions. You can also raise your hands um, to ask a question. If you want, if you want, we can, do you want to start with the questions in the chat? I can take some of those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so I'm just going to go off some questions of the on the chat. So uh, the first set of questions is about the over uh, overall tuition and uh, it's uh, Weiping already said that we cover um, we cover all the PhD students we admit. We do admit only three students a year. So that is unless there is some uh, circumstances going on, that's the limit, upper limit for our for the number of students we admit a year. Usually we get like between 90, 100 applications. And so we select three. So you want to it's about three uh, percent uh, selection rate. Um, Total years of the program, it's gonna depend on you. Some people finish in four years, some people finish in six years. We try not to hold people a long, here, a long time here. So you don't like sit here for eight years and they're like, oh, what did I do? Eight years of PhD now, like what I'm gonna go next. So, but yeah, so this is, it varies with the student, it varies with the topic. Um, you can always of course get external funding and people do get that depending on the topic you have. Uh, more details on the courses. I mean, I, I suggest because we have short time and there's many of you to keep space for more. There is a lot of information you can find online. If there's specific question about specific course, you can raise it later. Just general questions about the courses. That is a big question. And it also depends on the what kind of course, what, what is the question is asking about. So feel free to be more particular if you want to raise it again. Um, in terms of the questions, um, does the content of writing sample have to be related to uh, potential PhD research interest topics? It doesn't have to be. Um, I think um, it just show us that you can make an argument. It's solid, it's well-written, it's solid, it's making an argument. And um, it doesn't have to be like you, 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 you it's, it doesn't have to be like, oh, you've studied this before so you can study it at the PhD. So I don't, uh, you, can, you can do that. You can submit uh, samples that are not necessarily what you're planning to study. But like we being said, we appreciate proposals that show that you've done your homework. So uh, this, uh, I just want to reiterate this. So PhD proposals are very different or statements are different than masters. And masters, you can get away by saying, oh, I'm interested in this. I grew up in this street. I like this. I, my neighbor is that, you know, that's uh, fantastic. But for PhD, you have to like, demonstrate a little bit of, of, of knowledge about the uh, the knowledge about the topic you're interested in and show us why you're interested in. Again, like we read a lot of these applications. So you want your proposal to stand out by demonstrating solid knowledge and an exciting um, opportunity for, for, uh, for, for research and to open up new research topics. And also the thing I say to my students who are thinking of applying for PhD, when we accept people, we are also learning. So we're also excited about the students we accept. So you're coming to learn, we're also learning from you. So it's, so we're very much invested because it's a small program. We're very much invested in the learning environment we create. So we want excited people who are excited also to be here and proposing exciting things to study that are that resonate with this with the field with the fields that we've been already outlined that we are uh, we have expertise in. Um, in terms of um, say my research interests are related to climate change adaptation. Do I have to submit the writing sample again? You don't have to. Um, well, actually, Hiba, let me, uh, so I'm reading through questions yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, that specific. So if you want to know about the courses I have posted in my presentation, you go to the master programs website. Uh, so Emily can share that with you in the chat box. There is a booklet there for uh, all, all of the courses have a description in that booklet. So again, uh, our PhD program and doctor uh, and master program are really kind of staffed by the same set of faculty. So you will find there. And then in terms of whether or not 
you want to include a writing sample that must be related to your proposed topic? Not really. I mean, as I mentioned, your intellectual interest will evolve. We use writing sample primarily to see how you reason, how you conduct critical analysis, how you write, how you organize your thoughts. So the writing sample is for the writing. It's called writing sample, right? Um, that's what we look for. Yeah, so Hiba. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of questions. So in our person statement, we should avoid being explicit on which advisor we would like to work with. No, you don't, you don't have to avoid, just, just be yourself. But we're just saying that we do not assign people. We give you the liberty. So there are two kind of, uh, if we want to do typologies, there are two kind of PhD programs when you come in urban planning. There is people who assign you an advisor when you, immediate, when you join. And there are programs who don't. We are, the pro we are the kind of program that doesn't assign you an advisor when you join, and then you can figure it out by the second, third year. We're all working with you in different colloquiums, colloquia and stuff until you get to that point. So that, that is the kind of program we have. But you can say, I'm interested in this advisor, that advisor. That actually helps sometimes to figure out uh, your interest. But yeah, so no, just, just go with what you feel like you're want to say in that statement, don't like censor yourself. Uh, the advisor are the only ones in the PhD web page or can we pick someone from SIPA, for example? I will I will leave this uh, to Weeping to- Yeah, to, so yeah. Um, um, it is quite possible to have a uh, committee member from SIPA, any school in Columbia actually, uh, to be a sponsor, meaning the real advisor. Uh, you really need to, have it from the, um, within uh, GSOP basically, uh, really more within the urban planning program. There are a, a occasional cases where if it's really important for someone to have a, a outside uh, sponsor, uh, it, it's, it's the situation is going to be like co-sponsoring. So there's an internal member and then there's um, outside of GSAP, but still within Columbia, you can, uh, they can be co-sponsors for a dissertation, particularly on a topic that maybe the planning faculty um, isn't quite in that area of expertise. Um, let me also just address some more logistical issues that uh, uh, if you have undergraduate or graduate degree from an English speaking uh, institution, I believe you can waive TOEFL. You'd really need to read uh, uh, GSAS uh, application requirements more carefully. Um, and then if you have any questions, you can address to them directly or you can address to uh, uh, GSAP admission. So Emily, can you type in the GSAP admission email so that folks can uh, email them directly? Uh, in terms of visa process and all of that, we have absolutely no control. And we really try to um, get the mission letters out, um, you know, by March. And, and you know, uh, obviously everybody uh, by law, not by law, but by general practice have until April 15th to uh, accept. And so from then to September, it's five months, um, not quite four months, um, should be fine for visa process, but we have absolutely no control over that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I wanna answer the question and I, I think maybe my Weeping and I will, will answer it differently about contacting the professor before, before, um, before applying. I get, I get a lot of emails and, if you, my, my take on this is that uh, you have to see that kind of the number of emails we, we get every day. And so yeah. I, I would only contact in general, uh, just as an advice, if you, if you really related, your field is really related to that person. And if you've done your homework, but like general emails, like I'm interested in like transportation. I personally don't do anything related to transportation. Can you zoom with me? That's not like gonna that's not gonna work out you know so if, only if you're really if there's something that I, you can like beneficial to you from that conversation specifically that professor can help with something and also it's very difficult to the request to read proposals is not is not gonna work because we cannot like 
we cannot read for one person and not the other. That will be a little bit of a, a preferential treatment. And so I cannot say yes to one person and say I can't read to the other. And there, we have limited times. So personally, I cannot read proposals. Uh, sometimes if someone is asking something related to my research, I can answer. That that at least my my take on this. Uh, I don't know, Wei Ping maybe has. Uh, has no, actually, I have the same take completely. We mm -hmm. get, I mean, I don't know how many emails, right? And I always um, try to encourage my own students who want to apply for PhD students. You know, that first email is so important, whether, you know, someone will answer or not. It all has to do with how, what you do with that email. You asking for a meeting, that is a lot to ask, right? You know, our students, but if you, send a writing sample and the writing sample really speaks to your interest. You've done your homework, you know what we do, you know what the faculty does, you have a burning intellectual question. Well, that's a little bit of a first, e different first email of a kind, right? And you, it's the same thing when you apply for jobs. It's really the same. It, it really is, uh, unfortunately, we can't possibly answer all the emails. I try as director, at least I sort of um, encourage students to, you know, provide whatever evidence to strengthen your application. But really, I cannot sort of guarantee any subsequent responses on your personal part. Um, so I always ask, you know, if you're truly interested in this area, which seems relevant, send me a writing sample. And I'll take a look at the writing sample. Yeah, and I think sometimes that's because um, there's a misconception that you need to like you need to get the attention of some professor in the pro in the program so that you can like have high chances to be get to admitted to be admitted. And I speaking from experience, both as a student that who was on the admissions committee for three years at Berkeley, and then now as a faculty at Columbia, that's not the case. It's usually really the statements and the CVs and the letters that yeah. push themselves to the front rather than who spoke to who. So uh, that's a really good point, Hiba. Really, you know, we've admitted, in fact, most of the students we've admitted in the last few years, we had we had no clue, you know, who they are. We, we had no initial contact, but their writing, uh, their um, thought full kind of statements, the recommendation letters, I can't tell you how important those are. Those letters need to be so uh, speaking to your critical thinking, to your research abilities with details, not just, you know, kind of a, a lot of acclamation, but no details. I mean, I can tell you most uh, good Recommendation letters for a doctoral application should be at least one page, single space, completely full, possibly two pages, possibly three pages. I mean, really speaking to what your academic interests are, really speaking to how good you are in doing this and that, or even pointing to maybe some challenges you have that we can help. You know, when you, I mean, of course, if you're a great scholar, you don't, right? So, Everybody has room to grow and we like to see how we can support that. And so I can't tell you how important those three letters and the more letters you get, probably the better, but uh, they really should be at least two letters should be from an academic um, background to speak to your intellectual growth. And, um, and let me also tell you really quickly and Heba is absolutely right. Matter doesn't matter whether we know you or not know you, your application has to arrive, has to rise to the top. So we so generally we read everybody's, then we then come to a shorter list, then we come to an even shorter list, then we talk to that shorter, the second time the shorter list, and then we go from there, even a shorter list. Um, sometimes it's not because your application is not strong and sometimes it's because we don't have the faculty to really support you. We want to be responsible also. Yeah, so I think we should take some questions who have been patiently raising your hands. So Tiffany and then Amanda. Thank you, Wei Ping. Um, thanks, Hiba, for, um, can, I, can, can you both hear me? Yep. 
Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for hosting this in info session for us. Um, I have two questions, actually. The first one is um, regarding the TA or RA requirements, teaching assistant or the research assist, uh, fellowship requirements, do you have a minimum or maximum number of semesters for those? Um, and then the second question is, um, I heard that uh, you're currently interviewing for maybe three new hires in the department, um, which sounds exciting. And I was just wondering when we might hear more about that. Um, yeah, that's it, thank you. Okay, <laughs> that's why I have to end this right before 12 o'clock. <laughs> Here I is laughing. Anyway, yes. Um, so second to fourth year, quite likely most students would need to do all six semesters as teaching fellows because it's really critical that uh, we, our master's students are supported. It's also really important for a doctoral student to build um, a teaching portfolio because they actually each uh, needs to hold like a lab session or dis lead discussion groups. And uh, so really responsibilities that prepare the student to become a faculty right down the road. And even if um, your career goal may not be to become a, a professor, uh, we really think that the cross training in different aspects of planning is important. And for instance, we might just ask the student to do more of the studio, which is more practice oriented teaching. Um, it's also possible a teaching fellow maybe actually becoming a mentor sort of more in on an individual basis to master students so we do have one or two every year of doctor students doing that and when the research fellowship is likely that's usually when we our needs for the supporting master students are um, met and then we have uh, more doctoral students then uh, especially project needs of one or two faculty members, then it could be a good match, then we do that. So it's um, uh, pretty kind of um, integrated with the master's program, shall I say. I, I want to be completely honest with you, right? So because, um, so that you, and we do have students who want to do field work in their fourth year. Um, we absolutely give a flexibility so that they can complete the fellowship maybe in their fifth year. Right, so that they can go do field work and then come back when they write and they do the fellowship. In terms of the faculty search, yes, uh, we are full force on that. Um, we really very much are aware of the importance of supporting doctoral students so that will be a senior uh, um, faculty, at least one. And uh, we will know by next spring who will be joining us and they will be joining us in the fall. So for any uh, new students coming in, um, uh, next fall, and you will know what faculty you will be studying with. Okay. Amanda? Hi, um, thanks so much for this session. I have a question, and it's a little bit of a concern around the three person cohorts beyond just the application. I'd love to hear a little bit about the um, culture and sort of the social culture and the culture around working together. Um, three is a small number and I'm at the urban planning program at Berkeley now and there's quite a few more than just three. And so the collaboration seems to be really important. What are ways that you can collaborate across um, different departments um, and with master students, which I think Wei Ping, you were just speaking to. Yeah. Maybe Heba, you can answer because Heba also went to Berkeley. <laughs> so Heba yeah, knows. I I did my PhD at Berkeley and I teach here. I, I I've never seen such a tight knit community as the one here. Frankly, it is amazing. I uh, at Berkeley we, were, we it was I love Berkeley too. So I'm not uh, I'm not I'm not saying anything not not great. But we were like three. We were we were still segregated into groups of three depending on your interest. But here because the way we select students. They're usually people who can speak to each other intellectually and stuff. So it's very tight knit. We have a PhD room. Everyone is there all the time. They eat together. I mean, COVID has changed a little bit, but like there's always meals together, events together. It's a very supportive environment. People sharing all the time, like their teaching notes, their courses. They it's it's a very uh, there's always like picnics and stuff. So and there we're also there isn't a, there's some kind of we try to remove a little bit the hierarchy. We're also very 
collegiate with our PhD students. So uh, we, we have a very, um, we just had a PhD dinner on Tuesday with our PhD students and it's just like a fun environment. And so I actually, that's, uh, although it sounds small, but because it's small, it's, there's a lot of relationships across, um, across incoming classes. Like, so they're, they're friends across the different um, uh, graduation classes. Yeah, so Amanda, I'm fully aware of that. When I went to PhD at Rutgers, my cohort had two people. So it was very tough. Uh, and so we are kind of aware of that. So in addition to what um, Teba was saying, um, you know, then, you know, when you are TA, say planning methods or planning theory. So right now in the planning theory, they have first year, and I'm sorry, second year and third year students are TAing together. That really kind of binds them together because they actually, as the instructional team, they actually have to uh, be talking to each other quite a bit, uh, understanding how to teach, how to even assess learning outcomes. So that, and then um, quite interestingly, um, you know, we have quite a bit of students working together uh, on publications, right? You know, now I know two, uh, third year students are doing together. One fourth year student just published an article. She just sent it to me uh, in terms of uh, collaboration with the adjunct faculty, right? So um, the beauty of the smaller community is you actually do know each other quite well. And there isn't the, so I, I don't know how big, um, I'm not clear about all of the bigger programs, how they fund their students. One nice thing here is there isn't that sort of quote unquote competition for funding, right? Everybody has to fund exactly the same way for five years, completely even playing field, right? And so it removes that kind of sense of, you know, juggling that some students in some programs you have to do, yeah. Maybe we can combine the two questions. Um, one is about uh, whether working professionals can be in the PhD program, and another is about uh, for someone coming out of um, working in the past few years, are there any kind of prerequisites that they need to fulfill? Yeah, um, that's a really good set of questions. So we welcome students. I know there's also some questions about if you are from a policy background, would that be okay? We welcome students from all sorts of backgrounds, right? And 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 they do come from all sorts of background. Uh, you must have a master's degree, however, uh, before you can uh, enroll. Uh, and um, many of our doctor students have had work experience. And that's actually an asset, uh, not a distraction at all, because planning is very much of, uh, you know, professional field putting call. And when you graduate and you go out to become a faculty, you most likely will be teaching master's students and they are graduating to become practitioners. And so the understanding and familiarity with uh, challenges in the planning practice uh, can be really, really useful as you uh, begin to explore what uh, top topics you want to you know, put a few years on uh, to do your dissertation or just to become a scholar of such that is very anchored in the connection between theory and practice. Mm, okay. Ah, well, so, so I guess this question about choosing between teaching and research. Um, so when I say, well, of course, most faculty, especially if you are teaching in, um, uh, four-year university or with graduate programs, you uh, faculty all need to be teaching and research at the same time. Of course, there is uh, a, a really nice uh, and interesting and important career path as to become researchers, right? So say to think tanks, international organizations, now even NGO, large NGOs that have research uh, functions. Um, the research uh, kind of ability that you need to hone for those uh, places or in that career is very, very similar to a faculty who are teaching in uh, graduate programs. Um, the teaching part, of course, is a little bit different. So we do have uh, students currently with interest in that direction, and we are mindful of that. But if you talk to any of them, they will tell you teaching master students is a real good 
um, preparation for research because the students really challenge your thinking. And, uh, uh, and sometimes, you know, um, can be a quite a, a sort of jumping ground for your thinking and doing research. There's a question that says, if, you don't, if I don't have any publication, does it mean that I won't have any chances to be admitted? Just a clarification, when we're talking about the writing sampling, we don't necessarily write, uh, talking about a publication, like something that got published in a journal. It can be something that you wrote for a class if you're applying directly from undergrad, as long as it's- No, no, published. no, not undergrad. They can't- Sorry, from, sorry, from, from master's, from I'm sorry. <laughs> There's something, if you're applying as, uh, from master's, it can be a paper that you wrote for as, lo as long as it's polished. So it doesn't have to be like out in, in a journal. Uh, but of course, if it's out in a journal, it's great. Submit that. But if it's not, don't let that stop you from applying. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Did we? So Emily, did we answer most all the questions in the chat box? Yes, there's just one new one um, about uh, between the focus on socioeconomic processes versus spatial analysis and urban design, could you describe where Columbia stands or whether you have a more hybrid approach? Yeah, I think for planning in general is uh, more on the social economic analysis side. Um, urban design, uh, yes, you can uh, occasionally um, see students in our program. We, because in GSAP, there's a separate program on urban design that's more sort of integrated with architecture. We actually don't have faculty right now who, at least in a full-time basis, uh, who are very, very strong in urban design. So this is not a place, I think, where you would really pursue more of a design-oriented doctorate. Um, yes, if you are doing, let's say, analytics uh, with design, so let's say street networks or even uh, design uh, sort of algorithms, right? That's a little bit different. So we uh, had a colleague who had a very strong design background and doing lots of mobility research using that design background. That's different, right? Um, yeah. And this question, um, what kind of comparative study is the school focused on? Are we talking about how the Global South can learn from North's urban planning experience? I think it's the other way around. Yeah, I think once you get into the program, you will start uh, honing that question. We don't do that sort of kind of large scale ambitious kind, well, for students, it's very challenging. Generally, let me give you an example, right? We just have a recent graduate who was looking at um, land governance issues, right? So land use regimes in different uh, places. So the student looked at um, a city in Latin America, a city in the Middle East. I forgot, Heba, did she look at another? I thought it was three cities. Yeah, two in Mexico and one in the Middle East, one in Syria. Right, one in, so it's not about, you know, how, who can learn from, it's looking at for, in a sort of important conceptual that the how land regime is governed, right? It's a very similar question across three different places. And to discover, you know, on the ground, how practices of planning actually converge or diverge on that question. Um, I think then the more, uh, a PhD research question is less about, okay, what we can do on, you know, in a different city based on uh, a city A's experience. That's what we called, you know, uh, what we called a crystal ball. We don't have a crystal ball. A dissertation research is more propositional. That is, you construct a set of uh, um, sort of reasoning based on evidence of different kinds to answer a, conceptual or what we call empirical question. So it's not about really just sort of crystal ball projecting. That's that's plus for sure. We're not we're not like telling Global North uh, what to do, uh, Global South what to do from the Global North. That's for, that, that's definitely <laughs> something we're not doing. <laughs> yeah, we have maybe five minutes. If there are other questions, I think we did this pretty well in terms of 
uh, time. Okay, so we have, uh, what are some examples of cross-disciplinary work PhD students have pursued during their uh, studies? Um, yeah, that's a good question uh, in terms of action. So I know one of our uh, recent grad who is now teaching uh, in California, she did some work with um, uh, anthropology doctoral students. You know, they were friends, but they were also uh, colleagues because her approach to field work, she looked at public housing in uh, New York. So it was a very sort of ethnographical approach. And so she was in kind of a dissertation writing group uh, with uh, at least one, maybe two anthropology PhD students whom she met actually through classes. Uh, that, um, you know, together. So, I mean, PhD's uh, program is really a, quite a bit about self-exploratory, <laughs> self-discovery, and you go out there and, and, and find your peers. Of course, the students in our program are, you know, very supportive peers to each other, but they all have peers on campus that are beyond the program. Yeah, and also like uh, Gaia, for example, who's a very strong theoretical, like planning theory person who ended up uh, strengthening uh, her work in like coding. And now she does like uh, use use coding and using like use very, very sophisticated like uh, coding and GIS, GIS uh, kind of uh, research design to explore uh, uh, research questions and then reflect on them theoretically too. So you have people who are really like, uh, mixing methods and research, mixing anthropology, uh, political science, and urban planning. So you have people crisscrossing because I mean you have four courses or five courses you have to take here, and then the rest is that you can take around campus and meet all sorts of people, and this is what people do. Yeah, I'm actually since um, since Eva mentioned that she just sent me her pub publication, like essentially just came out today. You can take a look, you know, she has a publication now in urban studies um, using um, and it's about COVID. data, yeah. yeah. Um, um, if you have a question, you should ask now. I'm, we probably won't have another meeting session or open house. From the faculty, uh, perspective, why did you choose the planning department at Columbia? Ah. <laughs> For you and... I think someone, uh, Lincoln, you had your hand up. You are at Milton, Lincoln. Thank you so much. Uh, that was my question about uh, wondering about why you chose Columbia as a faculty member to come. Thank you so much. Uh-huh, sure. Um, well, I can really quickly, I um, uh, taught in two other universities uh, for, you know, more than, I don't know, 15 years. Uh, I think Columbia's strengths are, I'd say, what really attracted me to things. It's global outlook. Uh, and the second, it's interdisciplinary. Uh, we don't just say it, we really do it. Uh, that it's not as... Um, kind of a typical planning programs that very, go into very technical, go into a kind of narrow range of expertise. We really uh, are interested in big questions. Uh, we're interested in questions that really speak to what's at stake um, for cities or for planning. M myself, more for cities, yeah. Uh, yeah, same for me, a global outlook, interdisciplinary, and um, I'm also, uh, some of the most, fasc uh, most fascinating brains for me, like not, not only in a GSAP, in on campus are here, and just to be, <laughs> the opportunity to be here and having this um, opportunity to be uh, always having these conversations with them is great, and because it is in some ways, um, a compact campus, you always get these encounters with people and we all serve on committees 
outside GSAP. So we're always encountering people that you previously have read in books or something. So I, I really appreciate that intellectual stimulating converse, uh, conversation. And for me, I work on in international context on so New York and uh, its global outlook is, is pretty, pretty exciting. Yeah. So we have one last question. All of our RATA positions are only available to uh, uh, um, matriculated students. So we also have those for master's students. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, that whatever positions and opportunities have, we really try to see as a way of supporting our students. Yeah. So thank you all very much. I uh, really enjoyed meeting you all, even though it's virtually. I wish you the very best in your application. And we certainly look forward to reading your applications. And even if you can't join us, uh, I wish you all the best in your uh, next pursuit of your doctor studies or career advice. So again, thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.